Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with also of baptism, Jim was baptized. Jim was baptized with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him the eternal glory. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, it is our certain faith that your Son, who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. Grant that through this mystery, your servant Jim, who has gone to his rest in Christ, may share in the joy of his resurrection. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. With Reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Thank to you, you, Lord Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, before I start speaking about Jim, I would like to read a poem written by unknown author, if Jim, grandfather, father, or great-grandfather, friend, if he is there, what he tells you all. Don't grieve for me, for now I am free. I am following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day. To laugh, to love, to work, or to play. Task left undone must stay that way. I found peace at the close of day. If my parting has left a, a void, then fill it with remembered joy, happiness, and friendship shared, a laugh shared, a kiss shared. Ah, yes. These things I too will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow or sadness. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life has been full. I have served much. I served God. I had good friends, good times, and loved ones touched me. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief, too little. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart 
and share with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. So, this is a, I feel, consoling poem for all of you. We all know death is certain. Death is real. But it is not ultimate reality. Life is the ultimate reality. The life which is given by God. Jesus said, I am the life. Whoever follows me, he will have the life. And as I have read St. John's Gospel, Jesus said, I am going before you. I am setting way for you. I am preparing the rooms for you in heaven. So, from baby, from her daughters, I understood. I, when I visited him at Palm Garden Nursing Home, he had accomplished a lot of things in his life, from the pictures, from these things, and so many other ways. He served so many people. He served the, world, served the country. That is the greatest thing. And he served all of you, directly or indirectly. Somehow, he left some legacy behind him, some memory, something which can be cherished. He had left for you all. So you can have, you may have the volumes to be written about him maybe. You had personal experiences, love, concern, compassion. As I read in the poem, he had a laugh, he had a joy, he had sharing everything. He had good times, good fun. And in every one of our lives, we all may get the question, why did God create you and me? Why did God create me to know him, to love him, to serve him? and to reach Him. That is the main purpose God has created every one of us. So, being a Christian, our James, he might have understood this, the very first catechism question we all learn as Catholics in the little, when we are little children, the nuns used to ask us, why did God create you? Immediately, without any hesitation, every child will say, God has created me to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to reach Him. They don't know the meaning. But they say, parents are taught, our catechism is taught. So, that is, that is real in every one of our lives. When we do these things, if we know God, we love Him. If we love God, we serve. Serving, we cannot see God visibly. But we can see all of, him, all of the people. If we serve all the people with whom we live, we are serving God. Because we are all created by God in His own image and likeness. Amen. Goodness is there in every one of you, every one of us. God's nature is there. But sometimes we are human, we fail, and we lose the God's nature. And as Bibi was telling, she used to bring Him to our church, the Holy Spirit Church. I tried Bibi to convert her to our church since she lives very close to our church. <laughs> she is very strong. I have my own church. No, 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 don't talk to me. <laughs> she was telling me. But don't worry, Stu, one day I will get you back to our church. <laughs> no, no, I am very happy with my church, she says, as if I was forcing her to convert. <laughs> but she was sharing some of the things that how he served in the military and how he was uh, to the people and the grandchildren, everyone he loved, all these things reminds us that he was following what God demanded of him. God summoned the commandment. Jesus summoned the, all the commandments into two. Love of God and love of neighbor. We all do those things. But we may not be aware of that. We serve. We love the people. We treat the people like God's people. But sometimes we feel that we are not doing. We do so many things. So many little, little things. Sometimes we may not like the person. If you smile at the person, you are loving the person. You are loving God too. So that is the reason Jesus said, if you do anything in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, he said, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you are doing to me. So our Jim, he served a lot of things. When I was hungry, he fed me. When I was thirsty, he gave me drink. When I was prisoner, he released me. Or so many great things, he visited me. When I was sick, he gave me all these things, good things he did in his life. Being a military man, he had more opportunities to do that. 
So he did everything and he knows God and the baby <coughs> was telling when he was not able to go to church but still he was forcing her, please take me to church. I want to experience God. That is the inner desire. He wants to be close to God. So we all have the desire to be close to God and send John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 53 and so on the 6th chapter completely talks about the food, the body, how Jesus is sharing with the people. Whoever eat that food, what I give, they will have the eternal life. They will have the happiness. So he was nourished with the Jesus body. So there is no doubt that he is somewhere here. He is in heaven. He had a great desire to see God. That the very fact he asked her to take him to the church, which means he wanted to receive the communion. When communion is received, Jesus is fed in him. See, Jesus was fed being in his body. So he is nourished. When he is nourished, he has the reward of eternal life. That is happiness. And we all should be happy that we have angel with God who can watch over us, who can pray for us, and who can see, especially his daughter, baby. Now, see, you have an additional angel. We all are taught we have guardian angel, one guardian angel. But now she has two, and mom and dad too, both of them maybe, two angels. Now three angels all together. So in the similar way for the grandchildren too. So many of you have... So all these angels watch over you, support you, strengthen you, and give you strength. And they will be with you always. Okay? Amen. Amen. the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, the Almighty Father, raised Christ His Son from the dead. With confidence we ask Him to save all His people, living and dead. For James, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our brother James, who ate the body of Christ, the bread of life, that he may be raised up on the last day, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For our deceased relatives and friends, and for all who have helped us, that they may have the reward of their goodness. For this we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For Mimi and her children and family, and all the fam friends, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our shelter and our strength, you listen in love to the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for our departed brothers, brother James and his wife. Cleanse them of all their sins and grant them the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Somebody would like to speak about Jim? Mike? I uh, wrote this on a uh, notebook, so I'll be clipping a lot of pages. I'm tired of doing this. But we'll, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'll try not to just read, but uh, I'm not as good as speakers. People are doing it for a living. Uh, Papa, I always liked a good joke. I don't know if it's appropriate to begin a eulogy uh, with one. So, uh, I'll probably hold off a while. Sadly, it's been many years since he uh, told any jokes. Uh, 
Mark. Not, uh, Mark. Not for lack, lack of, uh, not for lack of uh, material. Uh, for his good never, uh, nature never left him. Mm -hmm. uh, his good nature was uh, never the jolly loudness of uh, those who would always be the life of the party. He was a, uh, it was true goodness. He was uh, always pleasant to be around, always. His sincerity was wanting to know how things were going on in your life, what you were up to. And once you told him, he calmly have an intelligent conversation with you about it. He was very knowledgeable and always up on uh, current events. He'd openly listen to your point of view. He would clearly state his own, in which he'd often add a dash of wisdom on the subject that he'd remember or experienced in the past. But he wouldn't argue with you. He certainly uh, respected people. In Papa's uh, demeanor, I'm reminded of a quote from uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Winston Churchill. That is somebody Papa truly admired. A man who once told a woman who was uh, berating him, uh, the lady was saying, uh, Winston, if I was your wife, I'd put poison in your coffee. <laughs> Churchill responded, uh, Madam, if I was your husband, I'd drink it. <laughs> 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 this cigar smoking, heavy, uh, heavy drinking craft man happens to be the only reason we still have as much freedom that we do around the world today. He was also the man that said Americans will always do the right thing after they have exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> Papa was part of the greatest generation America has ever known. But I can't recall him ever exhausting foolish alternative before he did the right thing. He simply did the right things always. You know what else he did well? He almost always gave good advice. I'll give you some... Uh, advice he gave me. Uh, the first uh, bit of advice he gave me uh, was pretty scary at the time, but uh, now it's funny. He said, uh, be careful when you meet her father. In this situation, a New York Italian is very likely to show up at the door with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> Another was, uh, lots of lime is the best thing for your home garden. It makes your tomatoes very sweet. I suspect he got that tip from uh, his old gardener, uh, Washington, Columbus Washington. He also told me working in an office is a whole lot better than digging a ditch. But the most uh, poignant advice was always this. There are only two things in life you ever need to buy with credit. A house and a car. Everything else can wait until you save the money for it. On a lighter note, uh, he often told me, don't go in the basement at night, at night, or that stocking will get you. <laughs> I was only four or five at the time and uh, believed every word of it. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think at some point, every kid in Athens had that, him uh, believing that stocking was going to get you. <laughs> it hung from the basement ceiling. Uh, and actually, it was the filter attached to Mama's dryer above. <laughs> and his ruse is real simple. He'd uh, carefully lead kids to it cautiously <laughs> while explaining how dangerous the stocking was. All the while knowing that Mama was switching the clothes from the washer to the dryer. <laughs> Upstairs. And uh, when she started the dryer, that demon stocking would fill with air and come to life and dance all over the place. Green kids would run right for the stairs. <clears throat> the whole time he would be going, Whoa! Whoa! Imagine he got some of that. He loved kids uh, very much, and they loved him. One summer he taught me how to swim. He knew I was capable of doing it. 
but just simply too scared to try. He uh, coerced me to the edge of the deep end at the Navy pool in Athens. Then he picked me up and threw me into the very middle and watched me muddle back to the side. After that, I became a happy little fish, and the rest of the summer, we played almost every day in that pool. I would always laugh at Papa in the pool. You see, his comb over hair would uh, look like a giant wet spider was attached to it. <laughs> He never cared. He was always smiling in that pool. You know, he was uh, actually a kid once himself. He was born in 1915. You want to know how long ago that was? Three years prior to his birth, there were only 46 states. The telephone was less than 40 years old. Human flight was only 12 years old. Uh, 12 years. Old and Henry Ford had been making cards for just seven years. And there were plenty of Civil War veterans still walking around the town. The average U.S. life expectancy was 52 years of age. Today it's 80. Boy, sure blew, uh, blew both of those statistics away. Amen. Way to go, Papa. During the actual year of his birth, we began building the Lincoln Memorial. The U.S. House of Representatives rejected a proposal to let women vote. Uh, Einstein published the theory of relativity, and most importantly, Babe Ruth hit his first home run. Papa may have missed that one, but he eventually would see uh, much great baseball play. Actually, he did tell me of the first time he saw Babe Ruth play. It was in 1923, and Papa was eight years old. He and some older cousins jumped on a street collie, trolley and rode it all the way from Brooklyn to the brand new Yankee Stadium. It had just opened that year. And just as you expect to see in the, uh, a movie depicting uh, New York kids in the 1920s, they snuck through a hole in the fence into the game. The Yankees were playing the Detroit Tigers, and along with Babe Ruth on the field that day, <coughs> Lou Gehrig and Ty Cobb. But if you think the Yankees were Popeye's team, you'd be sadly mistaken. The Brooklyn Dodgers played in the World Series five different times. Every one of those times they lost in the New York Yankees. Papa was such a big Brooklyn Dodgers uh, fan, they even named the team after him. That's right, the term Dodgers comes from the reputed skill of Brooklyn's residents to evade the city's trolley street car. I can see him doing that right now. Sure, the good old days weren't always good, but Papa's childhood in the heart of a city, which was the heart of America, which was the heartbeat of an era, must have been fabulous. I'm glad he certainly deserved it. He was in the right place at the right time. His dad was a tugboat captain on the Hudson River. And his job was to move train cars across the river from uh, New Jersey, New York, on barges. He pushed them uh, with his tugboat. Papa told me one of the most spectacular sights he'd ever saw was from his father's tug. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh became the biggest hero in the world when he first was the first person to fly across the Atlantic. When he returned to the States and finally to New York City, Papa, at 12 years of age, on his father's tug, was surrounded by every fireboat in New York City's harbor. He said they were spraying all their hoses full blast and sounding their horns and bells while the biggest ticker tape parade in the world exploded in the city. When he grew older, he continued uh, his historic youth. Uh, he was an usher at Radio City Music Hall. He 
Dodged his way on the trolleys out of Brooklyn, 50 miles, to just a couple blocks shy of Broadway, where he'd work and witness the most famous acts in the world. I suspect this might be where he uh, got his lifelong affinity for classical music. Mm -hmm. It takes some solace in the fact that uh, this beautiful music was available to his mind uh, as a young man of 25 headed directly into the heart of the most savage war, war the world has ever known. The nuns at his parochial school must have beat a good education into him because he was able to graduate St. John's University with a degree in literature before joining the army in 1941. Papa's distinction was uh, spotted right away, and after a short stay in the Army, he was transferred to the newest branch of the military, the U.S. Army Air Corps. While in the Army, Papa qualified as a pistol sharpshooter. I never realized his hands were as steady as his character, but the Air Corps did and began training him as a bombardier. His training was extensive and took him to multiple bases in Maryland, Florida, Texas for more than a duration. Eventually he arrived in England to begin his part in the war. And his very first mission was a catastrophe. Minor engine trouble erupted into a major cabin fire and the entire crew was given the order to abandon the ship before they even reached their target. Papa was lucky. He actually landed in a haystack in the French countryside. He and the farmer who had greeted him with a shotgun were both relieved when they realized they were on the same side. That accident was with uh, his original crew, the one he had just spent 13 months preparing for the war. And although he'd, spend, he'd speak through that part of the story, uh, there was always a tone of deep reverence and sorrow when he'd finish uh, that story by saying six of them never got out. This was not the way you wanted to start your campaign into World War II. At the beginning of the war, the B-17 flight crews were given a benchmark of 20 successful missions to be completed before their tour of duty could be finished. But as the mortality rate for airmen increasingly passed expectations, the required number of missions increased as well. It went up to 25 and then 30, and finally, there was no more mission accomplished, Mark. We just had to fly and fight until the war was over. When it was all said and done, Lieutenant Colonel James T. Corgan would fly and complete 32 successful combat missions in the European theater of World War II. Unfortunately, achieving 32 missions didn't just take you a month to complete. More often than not, hundreds of bombers would spend a five to ten hour day first getting uh, together in a safe formation over England. Fighting their way through up to 250 fighters hell-bent on keeping you uh, from the coast of France. Then, just to be shot at by a thousand of the nastiest anti-aircraft guns you could imagine. Only then, often, uh, the airmen would fly to their targets to see there was clouds. Couldn't drop their bomb. You now had to turn around and go through the same hell but no drums bopped on the de uh, dropped on the designated target uh, is going to equal no checks toward your mission completion that day. This happened constantly. Papa was stationed in England for 19 months and flew almost 900 hours to achieve these 32 missions. He flew with many different air crews because planes and people were constantly being lost and therefore reshuffled. Lucky as he was, as lucky as he was to survive all that, uh, his luck did run short. February 25th, 1944, a piece of flak ripped through the fuselage of his B-17 and into his hand. It was a terrible wound, and it kept him out of an airplane for over a month. Hopefully, everyone.
everyone here has heard first-hand accounts of Papa's war stories uh, from the man himself. If not, I encourage you to read the book, Decision Over Swineford. Uh, Papa was particularly proud of having taken part in uh, bombing the ball bearing plant factories there. Uh, because the success of that mission was the key which officially turned the Army Air Corps into its own military branch, the uh, United States Air Force. So I guess it's true, he not only named the doctors after him, but he also founded the Air Force. <laughs> it was an amazing life. Oh, but there's more. I'd like to add just one more historical military footnote to uh, Papa. After the war, uh, Papa remained in the Air Force for 17 more years. And this was, of course, during the height of the Cold War. And instead of uh, B-17s, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Corbin was now bombardier and master navigator uh, flying B-24s and B-36s. At this time, the U.S. Uh, had no uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, deterrent against the Russians. There were no uh, higher class submarines as, uh, as any means to keep the free world free. Uh, that's right, they used B-29s and B-36s. Now, to be clear, the one time I asked him if he ever carried nuclear weapons, he said no. And it's true that he's listed as a, an instructor or observer on many of his post-war sorties. But there is contingent of his many flights in the Strategic Air Command, where our most peaceful of patriarchs was the bombardier or trigger man, if you will, for the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. Only a man of his character can be entrusted with this, the hardest job in the world. Well, switch direction just a little bit, lighten it up. I'd like to mention that several years later, Lieutenant Colonel James Corgan was also awarded Citizen of the Month at Talmadge Terrace Retirement Home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our protector of the free world was also the most the kindest, most humble person you would ever meet. After his military service, he would go on to get his master's degree at Florida State University and then complete another 13-year career at the University of Georgia in the County Extension Office. He would be an active member of the Rotary Club for many, many years. His papa was always an avid reader, and in his later years, he dutifully spent many peaceful hours at the public library. He was a long-time season ticket holder at the Athens Symphony Orchestra. And in his kindness, he'd often take others to the library or symphony or simply on an errand because he had a car and they did not. Boy, he was many things to many people over the years. He was a golfer, a painter, a father, a grandfather, a benefactor, and a great husband as well. If there's ever proof that opposite to track, it was my grandfather and my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and although she died 16 years ago, Martha Ann Corgan is here with us today. Amen. Mark, Mark. She was a firecracker. Mark. His papa was always the reserve patron. Mama was always the life of the party. Amen. And papa loved her very much. Mm -hmm. When I arrived at 655 Westlake Drive after her death uh, at the hospital, Papa opened the door. He had a slight uh, hint of gin on his breath, and he said, uh, this is the worst day of my entire life. Mm. He walked back to the bedroom and closed the door. But they will be separate no more. This couple, who means so much to all of us in this room, will be together forever. And while their voices can't say it, I want to specifically thank my mother Amen. for making their final resting places with each other. Amen. They both appreciate it very much.
You know, every single time I'd rise to say goodbye and leave from a visit, Papa would look right in the eyes and say, uh, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I always knew this was a special send-off. Every time he did it, mm -hmm. he was always saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. He appreciated and loved everyone here. Mm -hmm. If you ever sent him a card or a letter, he appreciated it. Now he loved you for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I knew he was real love because every birthday, Christmas, Father's Day, Valentine's Day, Veterans Day, Groundhog Day, the list goes on and on, he would receive a multitude of cards and letters. Well, he'd not only keep these near to his heart, but also in his desk drawer. Mm -hmm. He'd pull these out often in his later years, and whether you knew it or not, he were often right there in his lap providing him companionship and comfort. And he appreciated it. I don't know how to end this eulogy. I didn't want to when I was writing it. I want my grandfather back at the pool, throwing me around like he did so many years ago. But after 98 of the most amazing years any of us could imagine, Papa is finally ready to rest in peace. Mm. For a man who sort of followed the flow of life, he surely created his own destiny. Nothing could stop him. He both lived and left this world on his own terms, as nothing left than an inspiration to all of us, mm. and even mankind itself. He was really that great. Mm. He was that extremely rare mix of the most humblest of persons, who was also the biggest man anyone could be. So remember his character. Do your best to carry it forward in your own lives. And never forget Lieutenant Colonel James T. Court. Thank you. Mm. Anyone else like to speak?